My name is Lauren Anderson, and I'm the Manager of Alumni Relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for tonight's session, Sip with Jewu, The Distillation, Styles, and Botanicals of Gin. We are excited to bring this program to you virtually, so together we can learn about the different styles and flavor components of gin. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. With the exception of the presenters, all participants have been muted. Please leave your cameras turned off until the tasting portion of the presentation. When directed, if you would like to turn your camera on, please do so. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat button on the bottom of your screen. We will refer to this section to take questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Set your view to speaker view in the top right corner of your screen. This will be the best way to see our presenter. We suggest selecting small active speaker video as the view. Since we can't be together in person for this program, please keep it social. Feel free to share pictures of your at-home setup, a selfie or photo of who you are enjoying this session with. Be sure to tag at JWU alumni in your posts on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'd like to introduce tonight's presenter, Jaquan Bowser, proud JWU Charlotte alum. He graduated in 2015, earning his degree in baking and pastry arts. After recognizing his pa passion in the beverage industry, specifically in spirits, his career has led him to many exciting opportunities. Jaquan has worked in a number of luxury collection and boutique hotels in North Carolina, and he's worked for country clubs between Michigan and North Carolina, including the Masters Tournament. His experiences have brought him into roles both in the front of the house and the back of the house. Jaquan currently lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, and works for a local distillery, Durham Distillery. He has participated in Proud to Celebrate with Sean Don, a class with Portland Cocktail Week, and most recently won a virtual cocktail competition with Wild Turkey Bourbon. We are so grateful to have him and his level of knowledge with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Jaquan Bowser. Hi, everybody. Like Lauren said, my name is Jaquan Bowser. I'm based here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we're gonna be talking about some gin today. So this is just an overview of everything that I will be talking about um, through our presentation today. Um, the different styles of gin, types of distillation, and botanicals, and then we're gonna move into our actual tasting portion with our cocktails. Um, <clears throat> next slide. So this is just the definition of gin. I'm not gonna read it um, verbatim to everybody, but gin is just a juniper flavor spirit um, that is made with ethanol. That's all it is, that's all it has to be. Um, the minimum ABV for it in Europe is um, 35, I mean 37.5%. And in the US it has to be at least 40%. Um, there's no natural flavoring. There's of course other botanicals that can be added to to your gin, but aside from it being uh, at least 40% or 37.5% and having juniper in it, it's kind of a free game. So some of the different styles of gin that I'm gonna talk about in a moment is gonna be our London Dry, our Old Tom, our Plymouth, um, Jennifer, um, Navy Strength, American Dry, and a couple others as well that aren't widely um, acknowledged as much by the EU um, and just by most, most cultures um, across the country. So I'm going to start off talking about London Dry. London Dry is, of course, the one of the first styles of gin. Um, it's gonna be that juniper dominant, that like pine tree, um, very uh, juniper heavy, unsweetened gin. So it's gonna be like your Tangare, your beef eater, your Bombay's are gonna be just name a few of the London dries that you will commonly see. Um, you all can't really see down here, but I do have a number of different gins that I'm gonna kind of look up and kind of talk about a little bit um, to you all as I go about it, but um, one of the gins that we're going to actually be doing for the tasting is going to be the Tangare. So this is, of course, a London Dry. We'll go a little bit more in depth about it when we get to that portion. <clears throat> American Dry is a better balance between juniper and other botanicals. Um, of course, gin has to have um, juniper in it, but it has 
other botanicals and not as heavy juniper flavoring in it. Some good ones for this is going to be aviation, which is um, very well known. Um, Ryan Reynolds really helped a lot with that. Then we have St. George. I have three different types of St. George's down here. So St. George is another another American dry that's very popular. And then I, like I said, like I mentioned, I live here in North Carolina in Charlotte. So we have a number of local um, gins, American dry gins here as well. So I have the chemist for those who live in North Carolina and or Charlotte. It's based out of Asheville, North Carolina. Sutler is based out of Winston-Salem. And then my gin that I work for as well, um, Conniption American dry. Um, all great, great American dry gins that I'm very happy to always talk about and lead people into conversations um, about that, that product. Plymouth gin is gonna be the next style of gin, um, another style of gin. So that one is, there's no real difference between that and a London dry. Plymouth is not very far away from, from London. So it's still, of course, based in the UK. Um, it did lose its um, regional administration um, that was basically the only thing that made it different. Uh, was more so like a marketing scheme for them. So that that was lost in 2015. Um, but there's no real massive difference between Plymouth Gin and Plymouth Gin is the only gin. Um, if you all are familiar with gin, that's actually the name of the gin. Um, so there's nothing really like special about that one. But it's always kind of fun to dive into a little bit of history with that. <clears throat> Old Tom Gin is um, the oldest style of actual English gin. So that one, um, you will see it mainly in America by Ranson. Um, if you all can see this, yeah, um, Ranson. So this one, you can see it has like some color to it. Of course, most of you all are probably familiar with gins not being color because it is considered a neutral grain spirit that is from the disc the um, the still to the bottle and doesn't go through a barrel or any type of Asian process. The reason that this one does have some color to it, um, this old, old Tom Jane, because it is made in America. And when James was being shipped from the UK over to America, they had to ship it into a vessel and those vessels being um, barrels. And with the barrels, it does distract some of those wood colors and have some sweeter notes. Um, they added sugar to Old Tom Gin. So this gin will have some sweeter notes than your London dries, but it kind of still goes along the lines of that juniper dominated, but the only thing that's gonna be different is it is a sweetened um, gin. Next, we have um, Geneva. So Geneva is one that I'm not as familiar with. I will, I will go ahead and admit that. There is three different styles of Geneva that it, that's basically kind of aged similar to a like a tequila, um, where of course tequila have a blanco, a nejo, and a reposado. Um, or well, reposado and then a nejo. I'm sorry, but same thing with kind of oat, you know, um, juniper. Juniper, um, there's going to be a young, a old, and a, and a malt wine one as well. The definition of juniper doesn't even necessarily say that it has to be alcoholic either. Um, and it doesn't have to be made in the Netherlands um, either. So it could be made any, well, actually, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. It does have to be made there, but there are some um, other distilleries. Um, another one local here in North Carolina. I don't have the bottle here. But uh, that one, they do a juniper style um, malt um, distillate as well. Um, Navy strength gin, this is probably one of my personal favorites. My distillery also makes a Navy strength gin. I have it right here. So connection to Navy strength gin for those once again who live here in North Carolina. So the thing that makes this gin a Navy strength gin and why they call it Navy strength gin is 50%, at least 50% ABV alcohol by volume is the minimum that it has to be for um, alcohol to a night. So of course you think of like your rubbing alcohol or the hand sanitizers that we've been using a lot of um, or almost the past year now, um, they don't really at night. Well, they should at night, but most of them don't really. And they do all have like flammable um, options on them. Um, so always be careful, but that, that's the minimum. And the British Navy had to have something high enough proof. So when they were shipping stuff and moving stuff 
um, across throughout the sea, um, if they like hit a strong wave or they end up like in, getting into another bottle and getting hit, um, they should get a hit. If that barrel or that container was to implode, um, break, bust on the ship, um, they needed something that it would, most of the time it would be on the same level as the gunpowder. So it will have to be something high enough proof that it was still at night. 57% was that product, was that ABV that made it Navy strength, um, where the name came from. And everybody, I mean, they were all able to ship it. And if the barrels did burst and they did have to go to battle, they were still able to ignite their gunpowder. Um, some other little styles of, of gin, like New Western. New Western isn't really a style that I personally recognize. New Western, one of the most well-known ones is gonna be Hendrix. Um, Hendrix, once again, they, they wanted to do it more so of a marketing tool, kind of similar to Plymouth. Um, but it, it, people still mainly recognize Hendrix as a London drive, um, but they do not do things in typical London dry nature. Um, I'll get into a little bit more into like Hendrix and how they actually go about making their gins. Um, some international gins that just don't really have uh, actual place. Uh, Roku is a great one. It's one of my personal favorites when it comes to more so international gins or gins that are a little bit more abstract. Um, Roku means six. So you can see, you can see like this bottle is a hexagon. So of course it has six sides. So, and the, the six also represents the six different, the Roku also rep represents the six different botanicals that they do put in this gin. Um, there are, are, of course, gins made like in South America and um, Brazil, um, Argentina and all those places. Um, those are more so like those international gins that just don't really have a big enough name for it to be known like uh, American Drives, London Drives, Plymouth, Old Tom and so on and so forth. Slow berry, slow gin, um, used to be a very popular style of gin, used to be very well known. Not many people would like buy it and use it and get it as much nowadays, but um, slow, slow gin is made with slow berries. Um, so you can imagine that being a little bit sweeter. Um, there's a, the only distillery I can think of that makes it is Sips Milk off the top of my head. Um, it is a sweeter style of gin. It's great for honestly this time of the year. You're talking about like your warmer dreams, putting that into a hot toddy, hot toddy, adding a little bit less sugar. Um, just that being that being your drink and that being your sweetener, the slow slow gin. Um, it's a great product when you can find it. And then the last one that I kind of hit on is going to be a barrel age and or a barrel residue. Kind of depends on who you're talking to. Um, kind of is going to dictate what they refer to it as. Um, I kind of prefer the term barrel uh, rested because most barrel, barrel rested gins that's been sitting into a barrel um, don't sit in a barrel for our, a long time. We, we're usually talking about maybe up to a year, generally less than a year. Um, compared to age, you think of like your bourbons and your whiskeys um, that can, that usually a minimum of two years and goes up from there. I mean, I've seen whiskeys go up to 40 years old, um, but my distillery just came out with a barrel rested um, gin as well. Um, so this is our Barra Age Gin. So you can kind of see like the color on that one, kind of similar to the Ransom. It was a little bit um, less color on the Conniption than the Ransom. But I also have one, a little mini bottle from um, Blue Coat as well, based out of Pennsylvania. And theirs is a little bit closer to our, our gin in color. Sorry, I have a light right here. That's kind of blocking some stuff and showing the colors. But yeah, those are gonna be our main different styles of gins. Um, they're all delicious and we're gonna get into a little bit more into the American Dry and London Dry, of course, um, when we go into the tasting. So now we're gonna talk about uh, types of distillation. So the types of distillation are gonna be vapor distillation, compounding, low pressure distillation, um, maceration slash steep and boil and as a more commonly known as um, one shot and mo 
multi shot. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of touch on low pressure distillation because this doohickey right here is what they use. This is called a rotary valve. Um, you all can't see it in this picture, but right here in this area, it says 68, and that's the actual temperature. So what this machine does is this is also like a medical grade machine. They, they usually use this in like pharmaceutical chemistry, science, and like more so in the medical field than they do in um, distil distil distilling, excuse me. Um, but it's, it's a great use for this machine as well. And you think of like your lighter botanicals that we're gonna touch on as well, um, like a cucumber or something like high sugar, like a fig or berries or even dates and um, other lighter botanicals like um, honeysuckle and whatnot that you don't want to put into your still because once those flavors steep too long, if they get too much contact with heat, they get bitter, they get gross, they don't taste as well um, with the like berries and the dates and the um, figs, um, those things are gonna be sugary and just get super nasty um, once it Kind of cools down enough for you can go into your still and clean it. It's just not very fun. But this rotary valve um, boils all the content inside of the bowl at room temperature. So um, like they, those are cucumbers in there in this still. Um, so they put cucumbers in there to make a cucumber distillate for their um, for the gin. So it it boils at room temperature is um, gonna keep those flavors light crisp. You're gonna taste like 100% cucumber. You're not gonna get any type of bitterness. It's real, it's not like oils or extracts or anything of that nature. Um, it's a fun way, interesting way to distill products and still retain a lot of, a lot of flavor. So to get into vapor distillation, um, the bit, excuse me. <laughs> The botanicals are usually um, on a kind of think of a, a pepperate, perforated sheet tray or rack, um, and then it's in a still. Um, I don't have a picture of a still, but you think of a round container, and then you have this perforated like tray over top, and then you have in your your liquid at the bottom and just that steam, that fire, um, pushing up all those vapors. So they usually will lay the botanicals and more so like a tea bag or cheesecloth or something of that nature onto these perforated sheet trays in these bags. So when it's being heated up, all those vapors come through and um, just flow through in and out of those botanicals, like your juniper, your orange and citrus peel, um, your caraway, cardamom, things of that nature, like flows through and it goes into the swan's net where it starts to, um, what's my words? Uh, it starts to um, condense back down into an actual liquid and becomes an actual uh, distillate. So that's what a lot of, I mean, that's what um, vapor distillation is. Um, and then one of the best examples for that, like big brands is gonna be Bombay. There's plenty of other, plenty of American drives that do use this distillation um, for, for their gin. You'll see a lot of people using a combination of vapor infusion and maybe something like a steep and boil or low pressure distillation or something of that nature. Um, compounding gets a little, a little funky. It gets a little bit more scientific. Um, so they usually have like their extracts and their oils and they usually combine that with the neutral grain spirit. So it's more so of a blending at that point instead of necessarily distilling. Most gin distilleries don't actually distill their neutral grains product. They usually buy it from somebody and then add their flavors in to match that neutral grain spirit and that flavor um, profile that they are trying to go for in those products. Um, Hendrix is a great example of a compound compound gin. Um, this is their midsummer solstice. So this one is gonna have a little bit more heavier floral notes and a little bit more sweeter than your classic Hendrix. But your classic Hendrix is gonna be more um, rose hips and cucumbers. Um, so they're using like those extracts and those oils and combining it with the neutral grain spirit and kind of measuring out 
all their ingredients and then adding everything together, kind of like heating that up a little bit and um, getting all their flavors to to taste what they what they wanted to taste like uh, for compounding hindrance and other compound gins. Low pressure distillation, that's the thing I was just showing you all and talking to you all about in the previous slide. Rotating flies that then boils at room temperature, keeping the integrity of the botanicals that are inside. Um, it's, a, it's like I said, it's a fun, cool way to distill. And um, the one that most distilleries tend to use is about 20 liters. And you think of um, a bottle of alcohol, usually comes in a 750 milliliter bottle. So it's fairly small batch. You get a little over 25 um, bottles per, per batch. So it's not really, uh, useful for bigger distilleries since they're doing so much and these machines are of course not cheap um, but for the amount that they're they're making um, usually you see people mean bigger distilleries like the Bombay's and Henderson um, Tangeray doing things like vapor distillation compounding and as you see on the next slide like maceration and one shot and sometimes multi-shot as well um, so get on, going into uh, maceration and, and steeping and boiling, steep and boil, um, there's no real like actual maceration going on with the actual, with the botanicals. What they're mainly doing is having, Tangeray actually does make their own neutral grain spirit, but Tangeray is such a massive distillery and they have things like Kettle One under their umbrella and Gordon's as well. Um, under their portfolio, it kind of would make sense if they went ahead and make their own, <clears throat> since they do have so many other products within that Diageo portfolio. Um, so they made their own Nutri-Grain Spirit, and then they added to the still separately um, with their botanicals. They only have four botanicals that I'll get into in a couple slides here. And then they add like some water, some uh, demineralized water to it. And then they let all of that sit, steep, and get all those flavors out uh, for like five and a half hours. But that part doesn't really matter because a lot of distilleries, a lot of London dry distilleries do use it. And five and a half hours isn't something that necessarily all the distilleries do. Um, and then they go off and go, they go ahead and distill that to, um, to let's say like 140 um, and then they bring that they bring that down the ABV uh, for the bottle. So Tangeray is 47.3%. So they add water until they reach that desired um, ABV, similar to how they cut bourbons as well um, when it comes out of the barrel. <clears throat> um, they just do it straight from the still and add water to it to get it to um, the ABV that they desire. One shot is kind of similar, a little bit similar to steep and boil where um, they're just mainly cutting out the actual steep part. Um, they, they add all their botanicals, they measure out their botanicals by volume, they add their Nutri-Grain Spirit by volume, um, go ahead and distill that. And then they, um, add, they cut it with the water once again for, by ABV for bottling as well. Multi-shot um, is a little bit more complicated where they distill it with the Nutri-Grain, the botanicals with the Nutri-Grain Spirit, and then they distill it a second time with water. Um, but they, they mainly do that before they can have a heavier concentration of botanicals compared to one-shot users way less botanicals um, in theirs. So then we're going to go into our botanicals. Um, definition of botanicals is just substance obtained from plants that can be anything, like literally fruits, seeds, bars, flowers, teas, grass, grasses. So some different botanical flavors that um, you would normally classically find in gin is going to be, of course, juniper, coriander, um, cardamom, licorice, angelica, orange peel, lemon peel, orange root. Um, coriander is the seed for cilantro. So it's going to have a lot of those kind of peppery, um, citrusy notes, uh, have a little bit of heat to it as well. 
um, cardamom is the third most expensive spice in the world. So it's going to have some spicy ginger, tangy type of notes, um, kind of like a menthol feel overall, um, like a minty, minty flavor to it. So this one is cardamom. This one's coriander. Um, this one is licorice. So I'm pretty sure everybody is familiar with licorice, um, more so of a black licorice. So they usually use licorice um, root. And so it's a dried out version. And then same thing with Angelica, um, which is mainly used for a binder and not really for like the herbal earthy flavors that it normally come, I mean, brings to the table. Orange and citrus pills, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. Um, I'm sure we have had our fair share of oranges and citrus, oranges and lemons. Um, and we actually are gonna be using it in one of the cocktails. And then orris root um, is gonna be dried out as well, but it is normally a like purple violet flower that's gonna bring some um, lighter, fruitier berry notes out. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the fun part of the tasting. So I'm going to run through this slide really quick and then I'm going to allow everybody to turn on their cameras. Um, so Tangeray, um, one of the oldest gin distilleries established in 1830. Um, they use deep and boil technique. The botanicals in here is going to be juniper, coriander, angelica, um, licorice. They made their own neutral grain spirit, like I mentioned. And then our St. George Botanivore, um, they were established in 1982. It's a 150 year difference between the two distilleries. And they do that two step process, like I was mentioning, where they do vapor distillation on top of um, steep and boil as well. And their botanicals are, there's 19 botanicals in this gin. So it's going to be angelica root, bay laurel, which is basically cilantro, bergamot, um, peel, black peppercorn, caraway, cardamom, cilantro, um, cinnamon, citra hops, coriander, dill seeds, fennel seeds, jun ginger, juniper, um, lemon peel, lime peel, orange root, sylvan orange peel, and star anise. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for a moment. You all can turn on your cameras and we can pour up some gin and get started with the tasting. And feel free to write your comments or your questions in the chat. Pour a little bit of both real quick for myself. I have numbered glasses, so um, lucky me, of course, with both of these being neutral green clear spirits, so I got four and two. Um, so with the Tangare, I, I don't give out tasting notes. Let me go ahead and state that. Um, I don't really give out tasting notes because everybody tastes differently. Everybody is probably all across the country, um, if not the world, like, up in Rhode Island, I know it's snowing up there, the ladies were telling me earlier, so they're probably thinking of us trying to be a little bit more warmer and a little bit more cozier um, when it comes to like drinking drinking anything probably right now. And it's I'm like halfway sweating in here. It's like 55 degrees here in Charlotte and somebody else might be in Florida talking about some tiki drinks um, and something more tropical as well. So. I don't really give out tasting notes. I'm gonna tell you all, um, like the botanicals, like I already mentioned, we can go back to the slide or I can pull back the slide and mention those to y'all, but I wanna hear what you all think. So we're gonna go through the tango rate first. Um, what you always wanna do when you're doing your tastings is of course have some water on the side and do a little whiff. I do usually like waff it, waff it like a little back and forth or waff the glass a little back and forth where I can get things in both nostrils. Um, it'd be, you'll be surprised of something that you will get on your left side that doesn't necessarily come straight through on the right side until it kind of like meets up in your nasal patches, like up here. Um, but feel that little smell. I swirl it around. I just have such a habit of swirling it around. It doesn't really do anything. It's gin. Do a little small sip. Um, just to kind of get your palate acclimated with that spirit and then do a little bit larger sip and kind of like wish that around your, your tongue.
what we are tasting, what we are smelling. Can they turn on their mics, Lauren, or do we not want everybody to talk at once? So this is going to be more so like your traditional, like I kind of mentioned, your pine tree, um, Christmas tree type ordeal when it comes to gins. Um, I think Tangeray is not as piney and Christmassy, Christmas tree like as other jeans. So I think it's not the most balanced, but um, you can, I mean, you can definitely get like those citrus notes, a little bit of that pepperiness that comes in, coriander. Um, the sweetness, the sweetness of this gin is kind of, is a little up there compared to most London dries. Like I mentioned, London dries. Um, Tin, I mean, London dries don't have any sweetener added to it, but that juniper and especially like that licorice, you're gonna get some sweeter notes from them. And even a little bit of uh, citrus, like orange citrus, um, like orange peel to be exact, when I taste it. So, oh yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Kelly. Um, so. You can, we're doing the tasting of American dries versus London dries. And if you're doing, if you're tasting a London dry, they're going to be, of course, a lot similar um, in the more so juniper heaviness. And um, when you, when we taste our American dry, um, it's going to be a lot more balanced and a lot less juniper. So, <clears throat> um, Boodles and Tangeray aren't really the same, but when we move over to our American Dry and you taste your American Dry, you can definitely you can like pull out some of those more so distinctive notes um, from it. Hi, Ellen. So, sorry, I had to rinse out my palate real quick. We're gonna move over to our um, Botana Boar or our American Dry um, gin. Do kind of the same thing. Make sure to kind of like rinse out your palate. You might need to smell your inside of your arm or you got some coffee beans around, give those a whiff, um, kind of refresh your nose, smell through your American dry. What American dry are we all drinking? Do we all have St. George or Aviation? I can see some bottles. Of, oh, we got some Blue Coat and some St. George. Awesome. I went ahead and did my first little sip of my American Dry. Honestly, James, I can see some questions. I can't see all of them. Um, honestly, James, depending on where you're at, if you're here in North Carolina, I have plenty of recommendations. Um, I have friends in other states that I can reach out to if you're somewhere else. Any comments about the St. George or the, your American drives? Another thing that I did learn from um, more so of a whiskey dude, um, actually Freddie Johnson, if you all, anybody drinks whiskey here, um, based out of Buffalo Trace is, <clears throat> I'm gonna use the rest of my tango ray, is uh, having your hand out and um, just putting like a little bit in your hand. Just switching it around like you got some hand sanitizer. It's close enough, it's 47%. Make sure to still wash your hands and just clapping it and like giving it a whiff and seeing what you smell in that. Of course, with like bourbons and whiskeys, you're gonna get a whole lot more um, notes of um, wheat and corn and things of that nature. But with um, gin, you can bring out some more of those botanicals, botanical notes and, and gin. So I'm gonna share my screen again and get us started on our cocktails. Awesome. 
So we're gonna go ahead and take me on uh, start with our first cocktail, which is gonna be a classic Negroni with um, the Tangare or your London Dry. So we're gonna do, so a tr traditional Negroni I will start off with is gonna always be one and a half ounce, I mean, um, an ounce and a half. Sorry, I like moving stuff around. It's gonna be equal parts of all your products. So one ounce, one ounce, one ounce of all three ingredients, your gin, your Campari, and your sweet vermouth. Um, for my Negronis, I like to kind of do a higher ratio of gin, since Campari is such a strong flavor, um, <clears throat> unless you're using a nice, strong, sturdy um, gin. So we're gonna start off with one and a half ounces of our Tango Ray here. Hopefully you all can see me. There's a lot of gin down here. Then we're gonna do three quarters of an ounce of our Sweet Remove. I'm just using Cookie D Torino. And then I got a little mini bottle of Campari over here that I'm gonna use up for my three quarters of an ounce of um, gin. Got some ice over here. And give that a quick stir. Um, most people usually tell you like 15, 20 seconds. Some people tell you 20, 30 rotations. I personally go by my glass. Um, my like actual mixing glass. So once my like mixing glass gets starting to get chilly um, by my touch, that's when I know I'm there. And I go ahead and strain into my glass. Actually, I'm gonna grab my ice cube real quick. You can use your same regular home ice. It's all good. I do have some big cubes here at home. So I'm gonna use that. Pour that straight over top. And then we're gonna do a quick little orange peel. And express that right on top of our glass. So with expressing um, orange peels, you always wanna usually use your thumb and your um, pointing finger. And then just give that a quick little squirt over top. I can't move my finger now. And what I like to do with my orange peel after I do that, I hope y'all can see that. Um, it just press that around here, brush it on the glass a little bit, and um, you can be like the fancy bartenders in your favorite bars and give it a quick little cut. And twist it around. And we have our Negroni here. Ooh, tasty. And then we're gonna move over to our next cocktail really quick. I'm gonna leave this up as well um, for everybody can at least see it. Just wanna go ahead and make this for y'all real quick as well. <clears throat> so I'm gonna grab my juicer. So for this one, this is just gonna be our classic bee's knees with um, the botana bore. So we're gonna do three quarters of an ounce of lemon, about half a lemon will be good, especially if you have a nice juicy one. So I'm just gonna do that straight into there. But we're gonna still measure our gin because our gin is our expensive stuff. You never wanna use up all your expensive stuff. We got two ounces of that. And then we're gonna do three quarters of an ounce, I uh, mean, uh, half an ounce of uh, honey syrup. Honey syrup, I usually use a local honey. I go to our farmer's markets here in Charlotte often and um, pick up ingredients from there. I got this honey from um, our Christmas carnival thing that we were doing here. And got some nice local honey from there. 
honestly, it tastes so much better. It smells delicious. It's so lovely. And then grab some more ice for our shaker thing. Pop that bar over top. I know it kind of like flew through that like shaker chain portion, um, but all you want to do is give that a nice shake until it gets nice and frost, frosty. You can kind of see the frost on the side of the tin. When I like run across, run my finger across it, you can see the lines from that. Um, string that into your martini coupe or Collins glass. And sometimes like with a Negroni, you may see some people do it on in a coupe or martini glass. And um, if, if they do, or if they do, or if you do, um, I tend to have my, my citrus pill do the same thing right over top of my cocktail and then also brush it down at the bottom and on the actual stem because that's where everybody touched their cocktail and you want them to smell that citrus when they um, have their, go and sip their cocktail. <clears throat> Do a little quick lemon peel, the um, lemon wheel. Then we're gonna drop that right over top. And then we have our bee's knees as well. Now this is the one I wanna drink. Awesome, we're down to the questions part now. Wonderful, thank you. I know I kind of like flew through those cocktails. So if yeah. anybody need me to pull that back up, let me know. And we can uh, include the cocktail recipes in the follow-up email so that you have those to make them again. All right, so we have some great questions in the chat already. And if you have questions uh, for Jaquan, feel free to put them in the chat and we will uh, pull from there. So I wanna start with Michael's question. His question for you is, what is your favorite thing about gin? My favorite thing about gin is <clears throat> all the botanicals. So you have all these different different flavors that are going into a product and the way that it like distinguates, distinguates and changes all the flavors when you combine them and distill them and the different proofs of them, of course. Um, I get I get really nerdy about like the botanical portions of, of gin. Um, because Mike was actually one of my best friends. Um, he, it was a Facebook post I posted like three years ago and I said, I hate gin because I was one of those people who was drinking like your Bombay, your beef beater and things of that nature. And I didn't know anything about gin. Like that's, that's the stuff that was always getting poor. Those well gins are a lot of the times gonna be those London dry gins that most people don't like. And most people don't know how to also appreciate, I mean, I personally would never order most of them dries, but if I have to drink it at this point, it's like, okay, cool. I can like appreciate it. I know what I'm getting myself into compared to a lot of the times people are like getting, getting gin thinking that, thinking something else. I'm not sure what they're normally thinking, but um, whenever I do tastings and people have this pre-notion that they're not going to like it. And a lot of the times they walk away saying, oh, that's not bad. And I was like, that's better than you saying it's horrible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question is, what is your favorite way to enjoy Old Tom Gin? Um, with Old Tom Gin being a little bit sweeter, one of my like honestly personal favorite ways to do it is kind of like in a hot toddy, add a little bit less like honey or whatever type of sweetener that you would add because it is this one specifically is already sweeter. So hot toddies are great. Um, they make fun Negronis as well. It does add a little bit more sweetness to it, but it helps cut out that those um, bitter notes in Campari as well. Great. Uh, Deborah is wondering about Tangare, um, saying that they have other gins uh, such as Rangpur and Ten, and are those made differently from the regular Tangare in the process? 
Tangeray 10 is made a little bit different. I have that, my Tangeray sweater on. Um, <clears throat> so Tangeray 10 is made a little bit differently. Um, the Ray, the Ray Prong, the Ray Par, I always mess up the name. That one is made the same, um, but it has different botanicals in it. Um, and that one, Tangeray 10, if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to remember. Let me pull up my book real quick. Because also I was going to show all these references, these great references I had. Um, the Gin Palace um, was one of the books that I commonly reference for all of this. And then um, the Drunken Botanist <clears throat> for like all most of my tasting notes for the botanicals. I mean, I didn't add like all the weird nerdy stuff that this book goes to offer. This book is a lot of great information, especially if you like to grow plants and whatnot as well. Um, Tangerine Tint is gonna have more jasmine notes, citrusy, witchcraft. Um, it's gonna be the same ABV actually as the London Dry. This is actually their export Navy, not Navy strain, but export strains on the Tangerine. I forgot to mention that as well. So it is a higher proof. The regular one that's sold out in London is um, 43.1. Great. Great resources and we can include those in the follow-up as, as well if people are interested in uh, learning a little bit on the background of everything. It's a different still, that's right. I'm sorry to cut you off, Lauren. No, it's a different yeah. still. It's a smaller still called Tang, uh, Tiny Tin. That's right. Good to know. That's great. That's the main difference that it uses a smaller still. It uses the same botanicals, but smaller still. So it's a whole lot more concentrated when it's going throughout the still. I'm sorry, I didn't have a, a good picture of a still. So I can like talk about how the flavors bounce around in the still. Very interesting. Um, so Richard is wondering about honey syrup and is it the same ratio uh, as simple syrup, but with honey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can definitely just use a one-to-one -one, um, ratio for our honey syrup. I will be honest, I messed up my honey syrup, so I used a little bit more. Um, mine was a little extra diluted, but you can easily fix that with adding in more honey or just using like a little bit more of it, like a quarter ounce more. Great. Uh, Sherry is wondering, uh, to go with these great drinks, what do you suggest as a snack or appetizer to complement them? Um, I would definitely, with the Negroni, you can go a little bit more heavier, um, do, do some proteins with it, um, with the bee's knees. And when I say proteins, like steaks and beef and stuff of that nature, that Campari has those bitter orange um, citrusy notes to it. The gin, especially with this one being 47%, it's a little bit stronger. And then um, like that sweet, um, that sweet, dark berry vermouth. So honestly, both of these will go great with a charcuterie board. Uh, I would say the meat side of the charcuterie board for the Negroni and then the cheese crackers um, jam portion of it for the bee's knees with you having, I mean, honestly, you already have that citrus and that honey in this cocktail. <clears throat> um, what else? I would say like any type of seafood for the bee's knees, especially with that citrus. Um, those citrus notes are gonna come out super well. I mean, bee's knees, even with dessert, if it's not, the, if it's not something that's overly sweet or doing like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a limoncello, like sorbet or something like a citrusy, orangey sorbet would be really fun. Um, Negroni go like very well with chocolate. I have done things with like chocolate Negronis um, that are super delicious or even coffee as well. Wow. Um, I mean, honestly, you can eat anything with these. <laughs> here as well. Uh, Melissa is wondering if you're familiar with Tomcat from Bar Hill in Vermont. Tomcat gin? No, I'm not. No? Okay. I know there's a lot of regional areas that have great um, distilleries in different areas, that's for sure. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and Stephanie, we will send the recipes with the follow-up email tomorrow um, and also the information about the books that Jaquan is referencing as well. Um, kind of going off that, 
vein, um, and I know you answered this a little bit earlier, but James has a question about some great small gins. Uh, so I know you mentioned there's some in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. So if there's any that um, you want to mention here, maybe there's some Charlotte, Charlotteans that would be able to uh, find those in their local areas. Yeah, absolutely. So personally, I mean, of course, I work for a Durham Distillery, so I'm going to tell people to buy Durham Distillery products. Um, and we just came off a of barrel aged gin, and so that's a limited release. <clears throat> Chemist is another awesome gin. Um, they're doing some really fun, cool stuff up in Asheville. It's one of the bottles I had lifted up talking about American dries. Um, I'm gonna turn down this light real quick so we can have a little better look at it. Awesome. So um, Chemist is a really great North Carolina gin based out of Asheville, like I mentioned. They do lots of fun and funky different um, releases as well. Um, Gin, of course, it don't just have to be juniper and botanicals. You can do like fun Valentine Day ones and um, like a, a Geneva, um, like I kind of mentioned with the chocolate malt. Um, malt usually have like some type of chocolate flavor. So they do um, fun stuff. They're doing a lot of fun stuff up until COVID. But it's been, I haven't seen a lot of like emails from them lately. Um, Sutler's is another great one. Um, here in Charlotte, they usually do this fun thing where they write stuff on the bottom of certain bottles. So it's always kind of like a surprise if you have something written on the bottom of your bottle. Um, and then of course, Conniption, um, we're actually one of the only distilleries that have like multiple styles of gin. Yes, um, Chemist does, but a lot of those are usually small batch that um, you only, can get more or less in Asheville or at the distillery for chemists. Um, so one and then we do do have... distribution throughout the Southeast. I'm sorry, what did you say, Lauren? No, you're fine. Um, so one question that I have is, how do we know what botanicals are in a gin? Are they on the side of the label or is it more of a Google while you're in a, re while you're in a liquor store kind of thing? Yeah. A lot of the times, um, you're going to have to look it up. I know my gin does it, but I the only other gin that I know personally that does it is Roku. Um, they list all their botanicals, and they actually have it as part of their artwork as well on the bottles. Um, so I know Roku does it. We do it. Um, I mean, I'm picking up some of the other gin bottles that I have, like, Aviation doesn't do it. Tangare doesn't do it. St. George doesn't do it. Um, even the little, the little write-up, I mean, on the back of the bottle for the um, botanivore, it just says 19 different botanical flavors. You can easily look it up, look up like um, the St. George, but some people, they don't really disclose it. Like uh, Hendrix, Hendrix doesn't really disclose it. And I know the Midsummer Solstice, specifically doesn't disclose it like at all. It's just a blissful with tonic water with a slice of cucumber and orange zest. And it's telling you like how you should drink it. It's not even tell you like actual what's in it. But compound gins to get a little bit more funky with, um, with stating that stuff because it's like proprietary and almost anybody can make it type ordeal. Um, I do want to point out this really fun gin as well that I have from Copper and Kings. This is basically a single barrel, barrel select type ordeal that I got at the distillery a couple years ago when I went. Um, actually, a few years ago. I'm getting old. Um, this is a copper pot still, non-chill filter, single cast American dry gin. It's 138 proof. Um, it's a very high proof gin. It was a one-time release that they do at Copper, Copper and King. I only bust out this bottle for like special occasions, but um, there are distilleries, like I mentioned, Chemist and Copper and Kings that are doing like really awesome fun stuff, um, special limited releases that are one-offs that you can only get at the distillery a lot of the times or in that city um, and you will never be able to find again. Such wonderful information. I 138 proof. That's quite quite a potent gin. Um, yeah, it's longer than the hand sanitizer that's sitting by my sink right now. That's funny. 
Well, I believe we are at the end of our program. Uh, so I wanna say thank you, Jaquan, and I wanna turn it over to Lori Zabata, Director of Alumni Relations to close us out. Great, thanks, Lauren. Thank you, Jaquan, for such an informative discussion about Jim. We are grateful to you for sharing your time with us and appreciate all that you've offered us in this session. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the alumni relations team for their help behind the scenes, especially Lauren Anderson for her work to bring this program to us. And finally, thank you to all of our JWU alumni in attendance. As you may have heard, JWU's College of Culinary Arts has evolved into the College of Food Innovation and Technology, or CFIT as we like to call it. More than just a name change, CFIT is a landmark interdisciplinary approach to education, meaning we work across areas of expertise to come up with creative methods of problem solving. As we continue to build upon our global reputation as a culinary education leader, you can directly support the students following in Jaquan's footsteps on the Charlotte campus. Alumni gifts of all amounts are more than just donations. They increase JWU's rankings, ratings, and reputation, which actually increases the value of a JWU degree for current and future graduates. To directly support our culinary students in Charlotte, please use the link in the chat window and remember that all gifts make a difference. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed this evening's session, Sip with Jewu, the Distillation Styles and Botanicals of Gin, part of the Jewu for You family of programming. Through Jewu for You, alumni can engage in informative and interesting discussions related to professional development, social and avid interest topics. Join us on February 24th for another Sip with Jewu session with Professor Sarah Malik. For the full listing of upcoming events and more information, please visit our events calendar at alumni.jewu.edu. We appreciate your attendance and wish you a wonderful night.